pick up the point about small and large population countries. In fact, uh, the greatest part of my focus this year is on the decarbonization of the Chinese economy. I'll be spending about six weeks in total uh, in China, probably not in the next couple of weeks. There's <laughs> been a, little, a little, little delay in the launch of our next thing. And what we are trying to do there is to persuade China that it could be a zero carbon economy by 2050. Uh, Xi Jinping has a phrase, China 2050, a fully developed rich economy. And we have recently produced a report called China 2050, a fully developed rich zero carbon economy. Now, is China a capitalist or a socialist country, company, economy? It, it's called locally uh, an economy of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, <laughs> Some people think it would be better to be called a capitalist economy with Chinese characteristics. It's a funny mix, but it has a very dynamic private sector. The solar PV panels, the, uh, the, uh, the, the batteries, the EVs are all being developed by amazingly uh, dynamic uh, Chinese entrepreneurs, overlapping with a state sector, many of which are those state-owned companies, almost act as if they were private companies in the terms of the way they uh, look after the managers of those. So it's, it's a complicated thing to understand, but it is certainly a form of market economy with many of the aspects of capitalism to it. Still building coal-fired uh, And I have to say, station. if I turned up there, well, let me come back to that. If I turned up there and said, OK, guys, what you have to do is to reject capitalism, we'd get nowhere. Right? What happens in China is fundamental. Their emissions are now 10 gigatons of CO2, 12 gigatons, including the other greenhouse gases. Ours are uh, 450 and falling. Even on a per capita basis, they are going above UK and European levels. And to win the argument in China, there is only one way to do it, which is to convince them that it is technologically possible for them to be a proud, rich, developed society in which Chinese people enjoy the opportunities, okay. the economic opportunities that we enjoy, that it's technologically possible to do that and be a zero carbon economy. I'm and just that's, gonna... that's how you have to win it. And in order to deliver it, you also have to use powerful market economy techniques involving entrepreneurs competing with one another to drive down the cost of batteries, to drive down the cost of electrolysis equipment, to drive down the cost of solar PV. So I think when you look at that large population country, where, as I say, that is where most of my focus is uh, this year, I would say the idea that we have to uh, approach this issue by suggesting the rejection of capitalism uh, is just completely the wrong way to I'm go. I'm going to pause you there because Fahana wants to come in. Yeah, on the question of subsidies, so in 2009, the biggest, richest countries in the world, the G7, came together and agreed to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, 2009. Okay, so that's why I'm convinced that coming together and trying to get these agreements, which then are negated, is impossible in this system without something else happening. And that something else happening is, first of all, I think my opponents need to accept the failures of the system. Yeah. And that's why I'm here, to convince you, but also to convince them to have a little bit of a, a wake-up moment, a little bit of atonement, a little bit of a, yes, we failed because we did not recognize the magnitude of the political weight and the magnitude of the problems cannot be fixed with techno-managerial solutions. The second point I want to make is about populations. So many of the countries that you suggested, many of the continents that you suggested, have extremely low per capita emissions. It's not the size of the populations that matters, it's their consumption, whether they're doing it, uh, it within their own countries or offshoring it actually elsewhere. So China's emissions are mainly coming from us and consumption no, no, by us. No. A lot of that is coming. 10% of them are. You can't, you can't say something which is just not true, okay. Parna. 10% so, of so them let are me coming finish. from 10. Let me finish. Well, that's 10% yeah. is right. still okay. a large number. It's a lot. It's a lot, number. but it's not all. That's it's not most. It's not most. It's not all, but, but it's the richest people <laughs> in, the, in this country that are responsible for the bulk of the UK's emissions. So the, you know, the bottom 75%, you know, the, remember the pyramid of extraction? They don't fly, they don't have cars, they don't have second homes, they don't have the kind of luxury okay. lifestyles. So I think we need to not keep looking at whether it's population that's the driver, and I think Tony's 
also, you know, very fixated on population as the driver of, you know, destruction. Right. It's actually this extractive system I'm which accumulates for the benefit of a I few. I want to get this, there's a whole queue of people.